I'm Cleveland M. Blakemore. I'm a scientifically proven living fossil. I even have a note from the doctor. For two decades, you have heard the rumors. Tonight, we will discover the truth. What is Grimoire? You're confused, I can tell. You're thinking, what the hell are we talking about today? You're wondering how a story about a retro PC game 99% of the world's never heard of fit into the Danknet channel. I get you guys, I get you. Let's just say, on my dank tier listing from moderately dank to dank as hell, today's video is near the top. Some people may know a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about today. There's pieces of this story tucked away in different corners of the internet, scattered from random articles and forum posts, reddit threads, and even steam reviews. But they're all just pieces to a much bigger, longer tale. To be honest, this should be a Justin Wang video or a down the rabbit hole. I'm a modest Canuck, this video is almost out of my league due to the sheer scale. But what do I do? Stay in my own piss filled lane? Probably. But that's not how we do things here. We jump in nutsack first. Worry about the shoes later. So what exactly am I rambling on about then? Today's video is centered around a simple man. Well, only part man. Cleveland Mark Blakemore, the internet's only living Neanderthal ex-military video game coder, who also happens to be part of one of the biggest hidden secrets in PC gaming lore. If there was a hall of the internet's greatest shit posters, Cleveland, or more commonly known as Cleve, would be the top of the list, and his alt on YouTube would probably be second. Cleve has been shit posting on the interweb since there was internet, the entire time. I found posts from early 2000s to like right now. If you asked me to describe Cleve in a few words, they'd probably be crazy shitposting insane Neanderthal part troll who was widely considered one of the most uncredible people on the internet and even a possible scam artist. That is, until he proved them all wrong. Again and again and again. This video is going to be broken up into parts. We're going to delve into Clev's insane history on the net, his 20 year long production of his game Grimoire, then briefly cover Sir Tech Canada and the Wizardry series, all culminating in a deep dive into one of gaming's most well kept degenerate secrets. Let's begin. Anyone who knows anything about Cleveland Blakemore knows that he's got some unique beliefs and views. A lot of them are borderline conspiracy, and at times he comes off as a full doomsday lunatic. The internet's first real introduction to Cleve came in the form of his Vultco blog. Yes, Cleveland is obviously a fan of Fallout, no relation to Bethesda, which is a damn shame to be honest. Cleve needs his own vault, kind of like Gary. Gary! He covers a lot of different things on his blog, like his hatred for Albert Einstein, his disdain for evolution. Another main theme of his blog, though, is around doomsday preparation. Khalif believes that it's only a matter of time before we're all sent back to the Stone Age from some kind of massive natural disaster. While all of us were shitting in our pants and our playpen, Cleveland managed to build his very own not-so-military-grade bunker in the Australian Outback. One of the most prominent things associated with Cleveland is his proud Neanderthal heritage. He doesn't look at evolution the way the mainstream science community does. Cleveland's personal belief is that sometime in the distant past, circa 40,000 years ago or so, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens crossbred, which resulted in the massive increase in creativity and intelligence. See, this is where the enigma of Cleve comes into play. See, he's not dumb. He might not be 100% correct, but he shows some understanding of the topics he talks about, even though he is prone to constant exaggeration. Take the Neanderthal thing, for example. It's estimated that 20% of the people on the planet carry some traces of Neanderthal DNA. Most Europeans and Asians have at least 2% in them. The scientific consensus is that there was crossbreeding, but it happened 50 million years ago. So odds are Cleve probably has a tiny bit of Neanderthal DNA. It's not the ADHD superpower like he thinks it is, but he's not necessarily wrong. He is most likely wrong about the dates, but as much as I love science, we don't really have the best grasp on our own history regardless. They're always revising dates and finding new ancient sites that contradict what they previously believe. Gobli Techy is the first one I can think of just off the top of my head. I can't necessarily hate on Cleveland for his Neanderthal beliefs and his doomsday preparation. Because if I'm 100% honest with you, a meteor or massive volcano eruption isn't really out of the realm of possibility. If Yellowstone went off again, that would pretty much take out a good part of the states and cover the rest in ash. Odds are we won't be around to see any of this, but it probably will eventually happen again. Here's the dilemma though. Just because Cleveland makes some sense doesn't mean I'm going to go out and Jimmy ring an above ground bunker Fallout 4 style like he did. You have to give him some credit though. He didn't just build a bunker. The Rain Man Neanderthal created his own OS for the sole purpose of civil defense and resource management. Just in case things get all doomsday. Unfortunately, this is one artifact that may have actually been lost over the years. 
I would have loved to have seen this in action. It's the long lost cousin of Temple OS. The more I read about Cleveland, the more he reminds me of Bert from that old Tremors movie. Except he's not fighting Tremors from his retro tech bunker, he's fighting degenerate Australian dick monsters. <laughs> That was a reference you will soon come to understand. See, as fun as Doomsday Bunkers and Fringe Conspiracy are, they're not what Cleveland is best known for though. He's best known for two things, delayed game development and shitposting. We've all seen internet tough guys, while Cleveland is the OG internet tough guy. He's been threatening beta cucks since the internet started. I found threads of people talking about him in his wild ravings from like mid-1990 Usenet days, before his blog was even a thing. I couldn't find any of the really early stuff, but apparently he's known for being quite uh, racy and homophobic, which seems to be a continual thing even to this day. So I think we can agree that some of Cleveland's posts are way over the top. But at the same time, there's like a certain artistic finesse to his insults. Like he never breaks character. They're always elaborate to the point of hilarity. He's relentless in his attacks. One thing that isn't apparent at first though, is that he can actually flip the switch and hold an articulate conversation. I know, it surprised me too at first. It seems he's one of those dudes that's all about the approach. If you're bashing him or critiquing his work, he's gonna sniff it out and raise hell. If you're asking him an actual question or just randomly interacting with him on a forum or comment section, he seems like a normalish guy. He's still a little wacky, but it gives you a pretty good idea that he's just fishing for reactions and having fun. Some people play a character online, and well, Cleveland takes that to the next level like very few have ever seen. Listen to his Indiegogo campaign pitch video for his game. What is Grimoire? It's a French word for a book of magic. To me, it's my magnum opus, my crowning achievement, my great display, an expressive jewel, my major work, a masterpiece. A master stroke, a monumental accomplishment, my piece de resistance, my tour de force. It is the wall of my cave. Seventeen years of hellish unending madness. Ridiculed as an elaborate hoax by Australians. Described as a mythical holy grail of RPGs. A fun organization for atomic Nazi supermen. Rumored by David Hicks to be an alien agenda. Associated with unsafe household chemicals. Connected to urban legends of bed disappearances. Incredible as it may seem, all of these things are true. Come on guys, see that exaggeration? Cleveland is an entertainer. And well, since we're on the topic of Indiegogos and games, I guess we should talk about Grimoire Heralds of the Winged Exemplar. So Grimoire is Cleveland's masterpiece. Grimoire is a western role-playing game like Wizardries and Might and Magic. It's a point-and-click party-based dungeon crawler with heavy D&D mechanics. Besides some early help with the King Step engine, Cleland actually made this whole game by himself in his spare time. He started the early stages of planning and development in the mid-1990s and then finally released the game on Steam in 2017. The game had a 20-year production. You don't see that too often. Cleveland created it to be the Wizardry 8 killer, but it would never really reach that status due in part to the sheer amount of delays, and it also received a lot of negative publicity, along with Cleveland himself. And it didn't take long for people to start looking at Grimoire as more of a scam vaporware instead of a proper investment. They also started to look at all the hype that Cleveland was spouting over the years as nothing but ramblings of a nutcase. The project was on a hiatus for a good part of 10 years. But after a few moderately successful Indiegogo campaigns, and an almost lull suit with another Steam developer over the name, Grimoire was finally released. It's an interesting anomaly in gaming. As far as modern day standards are now, you're gonna have a hard time selling this kind of game to mainstream gamers. And the ones who did back it lost faith long before it was released. By today's standards, Grimoire is kind of old, slightly outdated, has a pretty hard learning curve, it's a hard sell. The first version had some bug issues, but as of version 2, I think a lot of them have been taken care of. And I think the difficulty was adjusted. I read a few reviews that stated Grimoire was horribly punishing, and even the first battle can be overwhelming, but I think that was balance issues in the first version, because I've actually played some time playing version 2. And yeah, there's no tutorial, but it's not like how they described it. It's not a super punishing disaster that is pointed out to be online. It's actually a solid game. I've played a few hours, so I can't give you a, like a decisive review. 
but I ran around for about two hours straight at the beginning, just trying to figure out the menus and the battle system, and I never died at all. The game never crashed, and it installed fine. There was no issues at all. And if I'm honest, I like retro games, so the graphics aren't really a big deal to me personally. You have to look at it though for what it is. It's, n it's not meant to be a blockbuster mainstream hit. It's meant to be a retro-inspired D&D adventure that pays homage to an old generation of games. And I think it accomplishes that. I do have one weird issue though, you can't alt-tab out of it for some reason. But whatever, that's probably to keep immersion or something, there's probably a reason for that. So why am I talking about a caveman game developer and an old school RPG while dropping hints of secret Penasaurus monsters? Well, well that's because our protagonist Cleave was part of one of the most well-kept mysteries in all of PC gaming history. And I'm talking about Direct Soft and Wizardry 8 Stones of Armin. So before we jump right into business, I gotta give you a quick rundown of Surtec Canada just for background knowledge. Surtec was a Canadian-based video game developer and distribution company founded by Norman Surtec and Robert Woodhead in 1979, in the very early days of the PC, like I'm talking 30 to 40 years ago. And their flagship series was the Wizardry Games and later Jagged Alliance 1 and 2. A lot of the early success they had came in the late 80s, early 90s, and that was in big part due to a programmer named David Bradley. He was the brains behind the later Wizardry titles, up to and including Wizardry 7, which came out in 1992. After that, there was a dispute between Bradley and the Surtec brothers, Norm and Robert, over royalties and rights to the series, which caused them to split ways. It then took Surtec nine years to finish the series and finally release the final game without Bradley. When it was finally released, it was in 2001 and it was simply named Wizardry 8. The nine year gap between the titles is Surtec's little skeleton in the closet. This time frame shows us a side of game development never seen before, and it would have gone completely unnoticed and forgotten about if it wasn't for one insane shitposting Neanderthal on some obscure RPG website. And one simple question, why did Surtec Canada go bankrupt? Flashback to 2014, five years ago, on the RPG Codex forum, question was asked, why did Surtec Canada go bankrupt? Members on the forum pointed out that in 2010, there was a thread on the website explaining the whole situation in vast details. Details only really found on this website and this website alone. The thread was over 80 pages, 2000 replies. It was a shit show. And reading through it years later, I have to say it's one of the greatest threads I've ever read. But for some reason, the massive thread was locked down and moved so that only approved forum members who have been registered for over a year have access to it. A fairly effective way to lock down all information from passer buyers. I was only able to access about half of the pages because those were the only ones that were archived. And some other posts were screenshotted and placed on other forums in an attempt to piece the whole story together. We're not going to go over every post, there's over 2,000 of them. We're only going to cover the ones that are relevant. So, just like in 2014, in 2010 on the RPG Codex, the same question was asked. Why did Surtec Canada go bankrupt? When it was posted, the opinion started flying around, till someone with inside information was added to the conversation. And that person is no other than Cleveland Blakemore. At this time in Cleveland's life, he was 13 years into his production of Grimoire. In these circles on the net, Cleve was known for his views and his shit posting. He wasn't really looked at as a credible source because of all his rantings from his blogs and the different forum feuds he got into at every chance he could get. So when he jumped on the thread and started spouting insider information, and talking about how he was on a team in charge of making Wizardry 8, it was pretty surprising. He wrote, Until I went to work on Wizardry 8, it was an absolutely hopeless project. They had no source code, they had no design architecture, they did not have a single demo running despite months and months of work, which I put quotations around because it consisted of a bunch of losers having meetings around a failed actors table each week arguing trivia. Until I came to work for them, I gathered there wasn't anybody on the team who had the foggiest idea of how to develop a computer game. There was nothing running, there was nothing you could see, and nothing you could play long after they had spent $100,000 on salaries. Which is why when they hired me, they could not offer me anything reasonable as pay. They had already spent nearly all their initial funding without producing anything that was tangible. Within weeks of my starting, I feel that the first demos of character creation and main menus, there was a quality there I would describe as resentment amongst the other idiots on the team as soon as this happened. They had a perfectly good dream of going until I started to produce something real and spoiled it all for them. As far as I could gather, I was the only person on the team who had ever had an actual day job and worked as a grown man in an office. The rest of them had lived off their dole their entire lives, knowing little of the outside world and any responsibility for anything. They were likely very evil children. Everybody who has ever worked for Surtec knows that they had some serious, serious management problems. Serious. I've been employed as a contractor for 30 years in software development, and I had never seen clowns as deranged or sad as the Surtec brothers. They were lost. They were complete no-hopers. 
I've never seen anybody in 20 years since that was as pathetic, although a few companies have come close. The Surtex were mentally checked out. Lights were off, nobody was really home. When I tried once to explain to them why it was necessary to get artists who knew how to produce 8-bit artwork, they stared at me like I was Albert Einstein. They had no real thoughts or grasps why this might be important for an 8-bit game. They felt I should continue to hand edit the artwork every time it was revised and clean up the pixels and convert them to the right palette. Thousands of times each day, every time the artist sent it over again, they sent it completely screwed up in 24-bit color. Cleveland claimed to have first-hand knowledge on the Surtech brothers squandered their opportunities through bad management. Everyone disregarded what he said because there was no public information to collaborate anything he was claiming. They questioned him, and Clev doesn't handle that well. So he started to slowly drop bombs, Infowars style. The more he revealed, the crazier the story got, and the more people doubted him. I was the senior developer on Stones of Arnaham from 1991 to 1992, and fielded the demo at great acclaim at CES, where journalists and other editors got a good look at it right at the front desk. I was demoing it for anyone that asked. Everything on display was my work with the exception of Michael Shamgar's Modex library and infrastructure system programming. The project folded because I told the Sartek brothers, point blank, at the project review that followed, that the Australian team was incompetent and incapable of completing it given the current budget and staff. I told them that if they expected me to write the entire thing by myself without outside help, it would take a long, long time. There were supposed to be seven people on that team. The creative director, formally committed to a mental institution in Australia for four months after this meeting. Number two was the understudy for the creative director. He was fired upon return, and best of my knowledge has never held a job in the 20 years since it passed. The third person was a game math expert. He was fired before the CES show. He was discovered to be working on his own project while he was getting paid for this one. Didn't matter since I did all the work and some of the additional before I got sacked. The lead artist never understood the difference between 8-bit and 14-bit color and why this was important to the asset pipeline. The assistant artist, same problem. This guy was otherwise a really good artist. Some of his artwork was fantastically good. It was a shame he was forced to draw homoerotic monsters and queer looking fantasy characters upon supervision of 1 and 2. Otherwise this game might have looked spectacular when released. The UI artwork was to die for. It was extremely cool. Neo Primitive Stone Age look. It was the perfect for the theme and the feel of what we were trying to get. The sixth person on the team was Michael Shamgar. Mike had more talent in his little finger than anybody else on the team bearing me, and was incredibly good at building and coding infrastructure for game architecture. But Surtech cut his pay to some ludicrously weekly sum, and continued to pay the idiots one and two above an exorbitant salary. Mike was barely even part-time when the project was dissolved. Mike helped build the King Step engine for Grimoire that we use today, and it is probably the most amazing 2D step engine you'll ever see in an RPG anywhere. I think Shamgar was likely the best system level game coder in all of Australia. The members started to pick apart his story. There was no record anywhere of this so-called game Stones of Harmon. Cleveland didn't back down though. He just kept the shit posting going, adding more and more to his story, answering questions as they came in. Typical Cleve style. That is until about a hundred replies in, when Cleveland came to the conclusion that one of the people doubting him was actually a man named Philip Moore. Philip Moore was the second person on Clev's list. He was the one that was fired from the Stones of Harmon team. I don't know for a fact if this was actually him on the forum, but Cleveland believed it was. And one thing about Cleveland you'll come to understand, the man's an instigator. He takes things to the next level. He wrote, Philip Moore, just confirm these five points quickly for me. It's 20 years later, Phipps is burning in hell where he belongs, and the statue of limitations keeps you from being prosecuted even if implicated. People have thought for two decades I invented this stuff. I want you to tell everybody the truth. Confirm or deny. 1. Stones of Arnaham featured fully animated and colored cell frames of a giant throbbing penis monster and a living rectum with legs, which were based on concept art by Max Phipps. 2. At team meetings held at Max's apartment, whenever you wanted to use the bathroom you had to crawl through waist deep pile of vibrators, dildos, sex toys, bondage gear, and poundage devices. 3. Max's beta testing team was assembled from underage homeless teen runaways that Max was housing in his apartment that he recruited at the railway station. That he intended to double task as testers during the day and blowjob slaves at night as part of their room and board. 4. All PC portraits in the game were derived from male model headshots in gay wankoff magazines that had been laying around when Max urged the artist to drop some portraits quickly. As a result, all the portraits of men looked like gay porn stars and the women looked like 40 year old hags. 5. All the storylines in Stones of Arnaham revolved around transsexual furries who either murdered themselves or looking to murder someone else. All storylines ended with dramatic shrill monologues by the surviving queens in the game that went on for pages and pages of tedious dialogue with no semantic content of any kind. In one plotline, a magical diamond was hidden inside an NPC's anus and had to be smelled out with an enchanted butt bandit on a stick that was held in front of the party like a totem. 
It was called Bitchy the Hedgehog or something like that. Confirm or deny. You're all about to find out if Cleve Blakemore is a nut or is simply partially insane as a result of his existential nightmare experience in life. He couldn't make this stuff up. And while the board called bullshit, no one believed him. This is ramblings of an insane nutcase ranting for attention. No way he worked on some mythical wizardry game with a crackpot Aussie team who was run by a weirdo obsessed with dick and anus monsters. Eventually they were able to get a more detailed explanation out of Cleveland. I'm not going to read everything he wrote because there's a lot, but we'll skim through most of it. So here's Clev's more realistic take on the events with the DirectSoft team. I just wanted to add, for those semi-autistic people who are on this thread who have trouble recognizing Hyperbole, that there wasn't really a way steep pile of sex toys in the bathroom in Max Phipps' apartment. Here, I'll tell the literal truth about Max Phipps' bathroom instead of the colorful version. When you entered the already cramped bathroom, there was always a vibrator behind the sink faucet. Why a man needed a vibrator in the open in a bathroom, I'll never understand. The bathroom was already cramped. Max had this as a place to store a padded sex couch with metal railings in here and the same size as your typical Sears weighted bench. So in order to be able to sit on the toilet, you had to push the bench backwards towards the wall so that now it blocked the door to exit. But wait, I haven't got to the best part. Max always had a series of strap bondage gear and strap on paraphernalia that was drying over the shower curtain rod. It's like he had to have some massive cleanup each night after some wild gay sex party he conducted in his apartment. I will give the man one thing, he was concerned with hygiene because the place smelled very strongly of bleach that all this stuff was soaked in before it dried out. So once you were seated on the toilet, it was impossible to simply turn your head left even an inch because there was usually a 9 inch rubber dildo hanging at nose level and strap on right in front of your face at the curtain rod. You might think to yourself, this is an absurd situation. I'll just try to make the best of it. Perhaps read something, keep my head to the right and pretend I don't see any of this stuff. There was the occasional bump to your left shoulder that was like something in a horror movie. You just knew it was a rubber dildo poking in your back on the side, but you just sat there quietly ignoring it. This was part of the requirements for the job. This wasn't just one day. This was a team meeting twice a week. And after it was over, I was never really certain what had been discussed, coming away with no useful semantic information about anything. Wow. After that, he would go on to elaborate more about the teen runaways, which is probably the most concerning aspect of this whole story. One of the things I had noticed at Max's apartment is the mysterious phenomenon of teenage boys appearing and disappearing at random. Like he would be sitting there at his kitchen table reading over some storyo scenario material he had just produced and all of a sudden like a stage play, a person would appear. All of a sudden, this kid, who looked around 14, would emerge suddenly from what I had previously thought was a broom closet, cross the room behind me and vanish into another cupboard door near Max's bedroom. I'd hesitate for a second, not knowing if this kid was actually supposed to be here or why. I thought when I first arrived it was nothing but Max and I in the apartment. He had these strange presences in the apartment, teenage boys all around him all the time. A couple minutes later another kid would emerge from his games room, definitely underage, a little taller. He left through the front door like he was running an errand. I was kind of baffled and I couldn't help but wonder who these kids were that were always coming and going. When Max came out of his study, I said to him, Max. A kid just walked through. Does he have your permission to be here? Max would glare at me and make himself a cup of coffee without saying anything. I think some weird dudes I'm working with on this Stones of Arnhem project. Must be some kind of Australian culture gap thing. Maybe unknown teenage kids walk through people's apartments all over Australia and I'm just not that familiar with it. Over the course of the time, overhearing little fragments of their conversation here and there, I began to gather that these kids were teenage runaways that Max was counseling. When I first heard about this, I thought, wow. Maybe I had a total misunderstanding of this guy. He is suffering from some debilitating illness and still finds time to counsel local kids and help them out in life. Typical Neanderthal social doofus. Shortly before the meeting to demo the dialogue tree, I happened to bring it up in conversation with Philip. A little bit humbled maybe. Perhaps I just didn't understand what a great guy Max Phipps really was. He might be an even greater person than he himself constantly claims to be. Philip snapped back at me over the phone. Know your place, Cleve. I said, what? I was just wondering about those kids at his place. Are those Max's friends? Know your place, Cleve. This does not concern you. You are a simple programmer brought on to realize Max's brilliant creative vision. Don't involve yourself in such things because they're none of your business. When we had our team meeting that night at Max's place, I noticed Max was keeping the kids stoked with alcohol, beer, wine from his refrigerator. In fact, as Max was seated at his study desk, the teen was standing behind us drinking a beer that Max had given him. This kid was waiting to get back into Max's computer to play the computer games which Max always kept stocked up in his apartment to give another reason to have these teens to visit. This teenage kid gave me a heads up as he was sipping his beer. Hey, sup dude. I'm going to be beta testing the game when it's ready. Max already promised me and a few other fellows. Max said it's going to be ready for test very soon. I tried to smile, but I was feeling sick and dizzy in my stomach. That's great. Great. 
that's convenient. So, yeah, you live nearby? Max stopped testing and turned around to glare at me as if to keep me from asking too many questions about his young charge. Clev, this is going to need some work. It's a good start, but I'll need changes before it's stable. I nodded. Why don't you keep it here and test it just to write down some of your feedback and notes, Max? No problem. I'll do whatever you need to allow you and Fip to work on create the dialogue. I looked back at the kid. He was still smiling at me drinking his beer, and it suddenly hit me. He was a bit attracted to me or something. Or something. Then I looked at Max, I looked at Phil, and it hit me. This shit just got taken to a whole nother level. These two are hosting underage teens from a nearby train station, plying them with alcohol and computer games. His next few posts would cover in detail the meetings he had with the Surtech brothers and the main issue going forward with the project. The issue is with Philip Moore and Max Phipps. According to Cleveland, at this stage with those guys in charge and all the resources that they wasted, this game wasn't going to be able to be completed. And he expressed his concerns at the meeting. Norman Robert, as a result of the meeting, ended up scrapping the whole project and started to slowly close down DirectSoft. Cleveland finished off his rant by explaining that his time at DirectSoft was the catalyst for him to create his own game, basically as a big middle finger. The legend goes, the fall of DirectSoft was what birthed the idea of Grimoire. Cleve told quite a story on that forum, from a mythical game that never existed, to weird sex coaches, strap-ons, and even drunk runaway teen game testers. And the general consensus was, it was all horseshit. It never happened. There's no proof of this. You can't you can't believe a single thing this crazy Neanderthal su- Wait a second. What the hell is this? It kinda looks like a, like like a dick monster with a butthole mouth. Trans furries? What the hell? Cleveland's resignation letter, huh? What the fuck is all this? Well, ever hear of Storage Wars? Fast forward two years to 2012. Cleveland's story at this point, completely disregarded. It's been over two years from when Clev started posting his wild, unbelievable claims of direct soft degeneracy and surtex fuckups with no proof or anything to back any of it up. Only his own words. Until a man posted about the contents of an abandoned storage unit he bought. The storage unit was rented by Surtech years ago while they were still in business. And inside of that storage unit, there were a few things, like documents detailing the cancellation of Wizardry 8 Stones of Harmon. There was some signed concept art, insert throbbing dick gobbler. Oh, plus there was Clev's resignation letter. Fear not, internet doubters. This actually happened. There was an auction, and it had a lot of intention. RPG Codex even tried to buy it itself, but eventually it was cancelled by Surtech in my honest opinion. But before it was taken down, some things were saved and archived. But even after all that, there was still some speculation. Are, are Cleveland's accounts legitimate? Did this shit actually happen? Are we being trolled here? Well, there really wasn't anyone coming forth to disavow Cleveland's claims or even validate them. There were some articles written online, but nothing conclusive. Sure, some art was leaked, but was it real? You kind of need another voice in all this to kind of figure out what's actually going on. Luckily, in 2014, a content creator was actually able to sit down with one of the Surtech founders, and he got the chance to actually personally ask him about it. Hopefully he can clear up some of this shitstorm from our favorite Neanderthal, right? Clear the air, Robert. Tell us how Cleveland was bullshitting us this whole time. <laughs> well, I have a question here from the RPG Codex, and they're asking about the cancelled wizardry stones of Arnhem. Oh, right, you're going to get a scoop on this one. Um... This is baffling to me. Now, it's a bit of a monologue, but I gotta put it in context for everybody to understand this. Uh, yep, there was a game called Storms of Arnhem. It was being developed in Australia. Uh, we obviously, being in upstate New York, really didn't have a whole lot of interaction with these people in Australia, but we had somebody down there that was managing the thing. Somebody we trusted, somebody who was very capable. Well, he was running this show, and um, these guys, you know, the culture and the history and the offbeat nature of some of the things that go on in Australia is just a wonderful place to create stuff. We hired all the guys. We spent a fortune down there, a lot of money trying to get this thing produced. At the end of the day, we were losing our patience because there was a whole lot of graphical work but no um, uh, software algorithms and systems architecture for the game itself. So we were so close to killing it when our man in charge down there came forward and said, I think I found a Cracker Jack coder. 
Uh, why don't we give them a chance so that we don't close this thing down and lose a fortune in this um, debauchery? But it was under the pretense that this guy accept this assignment that we're very close to our patients wearing out and we're close to killing this thing. And if he hadn't stepped forward, we would have killed it. So we're in no frame of mind to be paying people huge salaries. If you want to save this thing, then save it. So if they want to build it, go for it. You've got X amount of time to build it. And at that point, we're going to stop the salaries as meager as you may think as they think they are. But that's, you know, we got to end it at some point. So far, that didn't really prove Cleveland wrong at all. That kind of coincides with what he said. They brought him on to help create Stones of Harmon as a somewhat last resort in saving it. Robert also confirmed that Sirtec wasn't very involved, and the project was in the hands of the Direxoft team, which was bleeding money, like Cleveland said. Let's see what else he has to say. So we merrily went along, and CES came up, and it was in Chicago this time. He flew up the Cracker Jack programmer to help us present the product. He did. We then flew to our offices in upstate New York, had a series of meetings with this Cracker Jack programmer who is an American military guy. And um, we just had some very frank conversations. And, and he was offering us information about things that aren't going very well. Uh, and at the end of the day, we basically said, we're going to close this thing down. And this guy's nose got knocked out of joint. He started spewing all kinds of trash on this forum that you're talking about. Uh, I am incensed by it. They've trashed my reputation that I spent 25 years building. I think it was uncalled for. It's unprofessional. And I'm going to leave it at that because, frankly, I don't want to create any more fuel to the flames. But um, that's the backstory on it. And um, uh, he tried to produce his own products after that. And I think he's got the record now for the longest vaporware in the history of the video game industry. So I think my point was proven at the end of the day that, you know, at some point you just got to stop with the all talk and no action routine. There was also all kinds of artwork being produced uh, that we were on that, that we had no uh, knowledge of. And when we closed the project down, we asked all of the contents to be put, like all of the artwork and the, the code, everything that was produced, all the intellectual property, to be put in a box and shipped to us. When it arrived, we put it in our in, in a storage lock storage area, and ultimately. Some of this stuff ended up on the internet uh, when the storage locker people improperly conveyed it to the eBay vendor. And, um, and he started selling some of this artwork and other things. So that's the backstory on that one. That's not been said anywhere because it's not something that I'm too terribly proud about, but it's unfortunate. And, you know, you, you take these things and you deal with it. So much for the auction and dick monsters being fake. Again, I was expecting this to debunk Cleveland, but it doesn't. It just adds even more credibility to the Neanderthal. The thing that drives me nuts about this is if Cleveland was slandering Sir Tech's good name like they claimed, why didn't they sue him? Or at least threaten? You can't tell me they don't have a legal team. All they did in the end was just meme them in Jagged Alliance. If everything Cleveland said on that board was a lie, and I was Robert, I'd nip that shit in the butt. But on the other side of the coin, if I was Robert, and the claims Cleveland made had some merit, then I'd try to avoid it and brush it under the rug like nothing happened. Kinda like how he just did in that interview. Something to uh, think about. See, no way does this prove everything Cleveland said, but it does add a lot of credibility to his claims. Robert did confirm a lot of the more innocent things Cleveland posted about, but he completely avoided the claims thrown at Philip Moore and Max Phipps. Robert just avoids that altogether and then pushes the narrative that Cleveland is hell-bent because they fired him and ultimately shouldn't even be taken seriously because his game is vaporware. Which is weird though because we have Cleveland's resignation letter, meaning he resigned and wasn't necessarily fired. And Grimoire was released, so it's not vaporware. 
I don't know, I'll give Robert the benefit of the doubt and assume that he just worded that incorrectly and definitely was not trying to paint Clev as a disgruntled employee to delegitimize his claims. Nah, he wouldn't do that. I'm actually being sarcastic here, guys. That's exactly what I think Robert did. When you have a person who acts like a total spurg online like Cleveland does, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. You're going to get some negative attention anyway. And that's completely understandable. 90% of Cleveland's posts are borderline insane rantings designed just to insult people or promote his game. A game that did have a development longer than some of my viewers have been alive. Quite a few articles have been created about Grimoire, but nothing really covers everything. The majority of the narrative concerning Cleveland is in regard to his game's lengthy development cycle and how intensely he responds to critics. Less about his full online history, or his connection to the mythical Stones of Harmony game and the fall of Surtek. Which is quite disappointing actually, because when you put it all together, one thing kind of leads to the other, and tells the story of what made Cleveland start his whole 20 year production of his game. Besides the random Grimoire playthrough, or other old PC Let's Play, there's only a handful of videos on the entirety of the platform that even mention Cleveland. One of them is the interview segment I showed you, the other two are from a YouTuber named Sid Alpha. Sid Alpha and Cleveland got into a bit of a tiff on Reddit when someone made a post regarding Cleve's game being vaporware built off of leftover stolen code from Surtech. Long story short, Cleveland responded the way Cleveland responds, started freaking out, belittling, even threatened a lull suit. Sid made two videos about the whole Reddit exchange. Even though in the end it was all ultimately corrected on Reddit by another user who mentioned that Cleve started working on his game before Surtrack even shut down, which makes sense based on what was revealed on the Codex forum. The time he spent in the mid 90s with that crazy Aussie team, Directsoft, was ultimately Catalyst that started Grimoire and the basic concept of it. And the engine for it was made by Clev and help from Michael after Wizardry 8 Stones of Harmony was canned. I'll link the videos if you're interested. The majority of it is just Cleveland spamming comments and insults at everyone who engages with him, while also posting on the RPG Codex website for everyone's enjoyment. But it's basically just a digital dick measuring contest and less about anything of actual value. Um, this post pretty much sums up my feeling on that subject. I'm 100% sure Cleveland was just fucking with Sid at this point for exposure, because it's been five months and Cleve's still in the comments section fishing for reactions. He's like this ninjutsu trained Neanderthal who's just lurking in the comments section waiting for the perfect time to strike and send some random helpless soul to an eternity of shit posting. I love this stuff guys, I'm sorry. I, I had Profit Muscle do this to me and it was the high point of my time on YouTube. There's almost something poetic about this level of spurgatory. I know, a lot of you are sitting here being like, dang Nent, what the fuck, he threatens people. And to that I say, Listen to my words, you sheeple. I'm trying to cleducate you. Go through that RPG codex. Come back here and tell me you didn't laugh your goddamn ass off. It's hands down one of the best form threads in existence. Prove me wrong. See, believe it or not, Cleveland's actions online are more of a persona than anything. One that he's been crafting for years now. Here's his announcement trailer he used to hype his game in 2013. This reeks of method acting. How much? It's really up to you. Someone on the RPG Codex described him as the Andy Kaufman of trolling, and that's like bang on. Cleveland is completely harmless, and when you realize that, he kind of becomes hilarious. He's looking for a response, and the worst thing that could happen with someone engaging with him online is shit like this. Like let's be real here guys, Cleveland's like 60 years old, he's got a family in Australia, he's not going to fly to the states and assault you. He's not going to sue anyone, he's a shit poster. I bet he's vigorously typing a 9,000 word essay right now, in preparation to digitally tear my Canuck asshole apart as we speak. You have been warned guys, I know I got a few top tier shit posters that follow me. If you engage with Cleveland negatively in the comments section, 
be prepared to spend your night laughing your ass off as he rants about how degenerate our generation is. And well, he's not wrong. The kids? No. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just reading, no, I'm reading what they're saying. I know, intelligent comment. Okay. I said this before and it basically stands every time. When I joke about this kind of stuff, it's because I find it funny. I'm basic like that. It doesn't mean I condone or promote it or even care the slightest how two grown adults interact online. If all of you guys started running around writing shit like Cleveland does, every time someone criticizes or questions you, the internet would be a brutal place, but then again I probably would find it hilarious. So in conclusion, even though the majority of the stuff I've shown you from Cleveland is pretty outrageous, the man is 100% capable of having a lucid conversation online. And personally, I think I'd like to have one with him. Cleveland, interview man, I want to hear the story from you. I'm sure people still have some questions. We gotta get to the bottom of this. We need justice for those teen runaway testers. To me, this is a story worth telling. And one of the most interesting aspects about Cleveland is how when he first appeared, everyone was questioning him. Over and over again, no one believed anything he said. They said he lied about Stones of Harmon. They said he lied about the state of Direxoft. They said he lied about the Dicosaurus and the Anus Rex. They said he lied about the trans cat people. They said he stole code for his game. They said his game would never come out and they were all wrong. So to wrap this whole shit show up, he may be an insane ex-military man turned shit poster with a propensity to fall back on hyperbole and ad hominem attacks, but I don't think he's a liar. And that makes me wonder, how much more the rest of this story was true? And that's where I'm gonna leave you. I just wanna give a huge shout out to Big Programmer. This video would not have been possible without your help. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know it was a little bit out of the norm, but I had to cover it. Tell me you guys what you think, and I'll see you guys next video. Grimoire, you can ride on turtles. You look for secret buttons, in secret places, doing secret stuff. <laughs>